Hello everyone, welcome to a special ASMR psychology lesson podcast. This is going to be a new idea that I'm trying out. I uh, was a psychology major in college and while I don't remember everything, uh, there are some topics that still interests me today. I am, I think, about three years removed from college, so I graduated in 2014, um, just to date this video, of course. So what I wanted to do was, again, just start uh, a series, kind of like I did the Game of Thrones podcast, and just see what happens. The Game of Thrones podcast was fairly popular, and I talked about maybe doing a psychology one, or just a general podcast talking about different topics, so I really wanted to do a psychology lesson, um, so today's lesson is going to be Gestalt Theory, um, this is a theory of perception, but it's mainly a German-focused theory, it was created in Germany. Now, you may not recognize the word Gestalt right away, but I'm sure you have seen examples of the Gestalt theory before. I guarantee you have, actually. Um, so we're going to go through a few things. This is going to be um, an educational type of video, so if you want to relax, maybe learn a little bit about psychology, um, hopefully you enjoy it. So we're going to start off... Uh, actually with a definition of perception, because it is in the realm of perception, the Gestalt theory. Um, so let's do that. Now what I have are a few sources. Now, these are not journals. They're not psychology journals or anything like that. These aren't official studies or experiments, nothing like that. These are all websites. Um, the main reason I'm doing that is because in order to access psychology journals, you have to pay a fair amount of money. I think it's about a, like $100 just to get access to the most updated psychology journals, and I do not want to spend that money. Um, although I do love reading um, psychological studies, it's not something that I can really do right now. So I'm using dictionary.com, some other websites as well. I even have Wikipedia, but I'm not going to rely on that too much. Um, but I have five sites I'm going to use. So we're going to start with the theory, I mean the definition of perception. So, of course it is the act of perceiving, um, but the more important part is apprehending by the means of senses or of the mind. Cognition, understanding, and I think this second one also applies immediate or intuit intuitive recognition or appreciation as of moral, psych psychological, or aesthetic qualities, insight, intuition, discernment. Um, so we're going to type out our own little definition of perception, and we're going to use um, this stuff uh, as kind of a, uh, just a little bit of help. So we're going to do this, this split screen. Um, so, I think, uh, actually, let's make this not bold. We're going to type out the definitions as we go, and uh, I don't have too many. You know, there's a few definitions here, um, but we're going to talk about each of these as we go. So,
So that's the definition I'm going to use. Let's read it just to make sure it sounds good. Perception is the recognition or appreciation of moral, psychological, or aesthetic qualities, insight, intuition, discernment, using the senses, with an S at the end, senses of the mind, and cognition. Um, so it's basically how we view things. Um, you know, you could say that the eyes are the, the focal point of perception. Um, of course, other senses are involved. Um, you know, it's basically the way that our brain views things and how we recognize things. And sometimes our brain is not very good at that. I think Gestalt theory, as we'll go into, goes into uh, some, some of the faults of perception, but also the patterns that our brain uses in order to organize things, because our brains do not like chaos, we do not like things that don't make sense. So Gestalt is basically a theory that goes into how we organize things in our mind and different tricks our brains use in order to do this. Um, and it's a fairly interesting thing to think about. Um, so what we'll do is we'll talk about Gestalt the word first off and what it means. Um, it is a German word and uh, here, here it is right here. Um, Gestalt is something that is made up of many parts and yet is somehow more than or different from the combination of its parts. So again, I think a, a good word to use here would be um, uh, chaos, which is basically in order and it's how something that can be out of order um, can somehow be turned into something that is ordered, um, simple, structured by our brains. Um, so we're going to type that out. We're going to type it word for word. I think that's a, a good definition. So as I type it out, um, you can read it again. Okay, I would like to not have this be pulled. something that is made of many parts and yet is somehow more than or different from the combination of its parts. That is a definition of Gestalt. Again, this is a German word, a German school of psychology. So now that we know what Gestalt means as a word, we can talk about what Gestalt psychology means. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to this little blurb on the top there, or in the middle of the, the screen, and we're going to read that and make our own definition from it. So, Gestalt psychology is a school of thought that looks at the human mind and behavior as a whole. When trying to make sense of the world around us, Gestalt psychology suggests that we do not simply focus on every small component. Instead, our minds tend to perceive objects as part of a greater whole and as elements of more complex systems. Uh, this school of psychology played a major role in the modern development of the study of human sensation and perception. So um, we can, we'll start to talk about the history of how this theory kind of developed or who developed it. Um, but the, the main thing here that I think it, we're focusing on is the idea that our minds perceive smaller parts in a greater whole. We like to simplify, we like to order things, we like to structure things, and so our brains are very, very good at taking a lot of small parts and putting them together into a greater whole. So I think that's the main message here, um, and we will We'll put that into a definition of what Gestalt psychology. So we'll use the first and second paragraph together.
I basically took those two paragraphs and switched them around a little bit. So Gestalt psychology is a school of thought looking at the human mind and behavior as a whole. It is the idea that our minds tend to perceive objects as part of a greater whole and as elements of more complex, complex systems rather than focusing on every small component. So again, our brains hate details. <laughs> it hates. That's why I think a lot of people dislike math, because math is very detail-oriented. Now, it depends on the person. Um, some people are big-picture people who would basically be the all-stars of, of Gestalt psychology or the, the prime example. And then there are other people who are way more detail-oriented who may not prove Gestalt to be as true as some may think. Now, a lot of this is um, can be applied to the way that we perceive the world, the way that we perceive things around us, but usually Gestalt is represented in uh, optical illusions and little pictures and stuff as examples. So I'm sure you've all seen optical illusions before. You know, there's very famous drawings that are all around the internet um, and those are examples but the, the, the point is it's not about looking at little pictures and you know getting a laugh you know about the fact that something looks different than what it might actually be the fact is that when we look at the world around us sometimes we miss details because we're looking at the greater whole that's to me what I think why I think Gestalt is an interesting form of study because it's it points out the faults in perception um, and how our brains can fool us so that's what I take out of this theory so now we'll go into a few um, there's three uh, definitions I want to go into next um, the first is Wilhelm Wundt or Wilhelm Wundt who is um, a psychologist who uh, basically formed the idea of structuralism and structuralism is basically the opposite um, so when Wundt, we'll go to the second paragraph here while Wundt was interested in breaking down psychological matters into their smallest part possible the Gestalt psychologists were instead interested in looking at the totality of the mind and behavior um, so that sentence is an idea of what Wundt was looking at. Wundt wanted to break down uh, psychology into its parts and figure out the small details. So uh, I'm going to just do a small definition. Um, he was basically f the, f the founder of structuralism, or I'll, I'll say this. So, uh, the way, the reason that he pertains to Gestalt is because he formed an idea which inspired the opposite theory, which is Gestalt. So he formed the theory of structuralism, which focused on breaking down psychological matters into their smallest parts. Gestalt theory was, in effect, a response to this idea. So that's Wilhelm Wundt. Uh, as we go on, we can talk about... Um, Thinkers of the time, this is, um, uh, uh, not thinkers of the time, some of these are from around this era, which is like late 1800s, around there, um, but there were uh, philosophers who um, inspired this idea. I think Immanuel Kant is a philosopher that m some people may know, the other two I don't know much about, Ern Ernst Mach and Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, or Gaeth, I'm not sure how you say that. there is some philosoph uh, philosophical influence in this theory as well. Um, 
but there are, this is the part that I really want to talk about, there were three main people who had an influence on this, and um, they all were um, part of the Berlin School of Psychology, Psychology I think it's called, um, and the school eventually became the um, center for studying Gestalt. So, I'm going to write down, um, so these three people were basically, you know, as the founders, um, and they all brought different, uh, different points of view into this, uh, this theory. So, So, what I wrote down was there were uh, Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kafka, Wolf, uh, Wolf, Wolfgang Kohler, were the three main founders of Gestalt uh, psychology who were interested in learning about perception, and they wanted to study the idea that the whole is different than the sum of its parts. That sentence is a great uh, just motto for Gestalt, is that when you have separate parts, you look at them individually, you might see one thing, but then when you put them all together, you might see something completely different. Um, so that's just, just to kind of drop some names of, of who inspired this, this theory. Um, so the next part <coughs> talks about um, how there were, so, so this part is basically a, 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 an overview of the rest of this, and this is going to be the end, or not the end of the lesson, but the, 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 the last part of what I go into, and I will go into each of these. Um, there are several laws here, and they just talk about different ideas in Gestalt, um, different patterns that the brain will recognize. Um, so, we'll read this whole part. Um, have you ever noticed how a series of flashing lights often appear to be moving, such as neon signs or strands of Christmas lights? According to Gestalt psychology, the apparent movement happens because our minds fill in missing information. This belief that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, uh, some of the individual parts, led to the discovery of several different phenomena that occur during perception. In order to better understand how human perception works, Gestalt psychologists proposed a number of laws of perceptual organization, including the laws of similarity, uh, pragnans, again, the pronunciation is probably bad, proximity, continuity, and closure. There are some more as well. And then they, they talk about some examples. We'll, we'll go into that. So, <clears throat> Gestalt laws of perceptual organization are um, that um, Instead of greater, all right, different. Um, I think that's better. Um, and then I'll just write down some examples. Um, so the Gestalt laws of perceptual organization are 
are a list of ideas that discuss the various ways our brains will recognize how the whole is different than the sum of its parts. Um, so we're just kind of going through uh, the ones below it. So examples include proximity, similarity, and closure, um, etc. So let's keep going. And you can see this isn't a very difficult. Um, uh, this isn't a very difficult idea to, to once you get into it, you know. I think psychology, a lot of times, people think it, it is, it's very heady. It's a lot of it's, uh, it's funny, when I was studying psychology, you know, a lot of the theories are kind of common sense, but uh, once you get into it, you start to, you, you, it's almost, you know, if you think about Gestalt, if you were to think about, you know, yeah, sometimes we see, see things differently than they actually are seems pretty obvious and I think we've all experienced that but then once you start to study how that is and the the why um, that's when you are kind of amazed by how how our brains work so it's it, I think psychology that's what makes psychology interesting to me is that it's stuff that we all know we, we we've all experienced this we, we probably do every single day but once you start digging deeper and understanding why it's like that, then you start to um, get surprised and you learn quite a bit. So I'm going to use Wikipedia for this next part. Um, and this is pretty much what we've already been talking about, but it adds a little bit extra. Um, so there are some terms that are in this definition that I think are important. So pragnons are... I'm, I really don't know how to say that. Prognons. Uh, the fundamental principle of Gestalt is the law of prognons, which says that we tend to order our experience in a manner that is regular, orderly, symmetrical, and simple. So this goes back to what I said about the fact that our brains are very stubborn. We <laughs> they like to our brains like to organize things. We don't like disorder. We don't like chaos because it confuses us. It's uh, one thing that I love um, is comparing evolution and how evolution affects uh, psychology. So if you were to think about how we evolved as a species, and I'm not going to go into this too much, but as we evolved, um, we would use um, perception to basically gain an advantage in survival. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, if you were to talk about um, proximity in the wild, if you are a hunter and you see, um, you know, a herd of of um, buffalo or whatever, you know, if you're, um, you know, hunting, you would assume that, you know, there is a greater chance that you would be able to, um, you know, get dinner that night because there's a, a group of them together, so you may use proximity in order to discover a herd or it's it's you know how you would visually um, organize things in order to get an advantage so when things are disordered and our brains are confused that's when we're at a bigger danger that's when we're a little bit more unsafe so it's almost like these theories allow us to our, allow our brains to feel as though they're safe they're in control they know what's going on and we're not being surprised because when we're surprised we start to get nervous we start to sweat um, and those are all signs that we're in danger so it's a little bit of like an evolutionary connection I know it might seem like a stretch but I really do think that most psychological theories are rooted somehow in survival um, so prognons <laughs> I get back. Um, we'll, we'll just write down. It is. <clears throat> All right, if I can learn to spell.
So basically our, our brains love simplicity. Our, we like everything structured. We like things to be in, in a way in which we can control. Because once we, we lose control, again, that's when we're in trouble. So that's where this is rooted in. I think that's what this definition is, is talking about. <clears throat> so, let's talk about each law. So basically, um, these are, again represent a greater aspect of perception. Um, so don't view these pictures as the base value. Um, as you know, we use Gestalt to look at funny pictures. There is a greater meaning here, um, and it is connected to other things that we see in the world. And, and, and you can maybe pick out some of these things. Maybe if you're walking around, you might say, oh, my brain is probably seeing this that way because of Gestalt or something, you know. So proximity um, is the idea that an individual will, will perceive an assortment of objects in a way um, that if they are close together, we assume them to be in a group. So this might seem really simple or obvious, you know, like you, you can use the example, if a lot of people are standing next to each other, your brain immediately thinks they must all know each other. They are a group of people because they are standing next to each other. That's basically what it means. So, um, I actually have I do we can I have pictures um, there must be a proximity one here they're not in order they're in different order but I think we'll be able to find it so um, this this actually I think is way better let's use this site um, so you can see that in the quotes there objects that are closer together are perceived as more related than objects that are further apart so if you have one person standing at a bus stop, and then on the other side of the bus stop, maybe 10 feet away, there's another person, you might assume they don't know each other. But if you have two people standing within a foot of each other at a bus stop, you may assume that they do know each other. That is proximity. That's what that, that's a great example. And we use pictures um, as an example as well. When you look at these group of dots, you assume that the 12 dots on the left are related um, to each other, and you assume that the uh, nine dots um, on the right are close to each other, when really they're just all dots. There's, there's no law of nature, <laughs> if you will, that says that the group on the right is related and the group on the left is related to each other. It's your brain that is creating that, and that's, that's proximity. Pretty simple, actually. All right, similarity. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna go back here. Um, so this one, again, most of these are pretty simple. The law of similarity states that elements within an assortment of objects are perceptually grouped together if they are similar to each other. So you can talk about um, color, form, shape, um, texture. Basically. If there are characteristics of things that are similar, then you may, your brain may group them together. So again, we're going back to this whole thing that the whole may be different than the sum of its parts. So let's see if we can find similarity. I think similarity I saw maybe up here. Let's see if I can find it. Proximity, continuation, parallelism, similarity. Okay. So this is a good <clears throat> example. Um, so let's look at the quotes again. Elements that share similar characteristics are perceived as more related than elements that don't share. I, I think that's a great definition. I'm just going to write that. Elements that share similar characteristics are perceived Okay. 
So as an example, down here you can see, of course, there's the proximity law in uh, being used here because this is a group of dots. However, there are black dots and red dots. So when you look at the red dots, you may see them as being similar to each other because they are red, and you may see the black dots um, as similar. And in addition, because the red dots are a brighter color, you may your, your brain may focus on those as being in the foreground, whereas the black dots may seem like they're in the background. They seem, you know, oh, it's almost like the red dots are more important than the black dots. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I guess you could use another example could be to think of a football team. You look and they all have the same uniforms, they have the same helmets, they are all wearing the same shoes. Um, so your brain will say, these players are all very similar to each other. Um, that is kind of a real world example, if you will. So that's similarity. Again, it seems so obvious and common sense, but it's just, again, perception is not, um, it's not something that we're unfamiliar with. We all perceive things every day. It's just sometimes when you break it down, that's when you start to, to find or, or discover things that you never really thought about before. Or, you know, again, the question of why or how this all works. So the next one is closure. There's a good picture up here of closure. Um, so the law of closure basically says that um, we view objects such as shapes, letters, pictures as being whole when they may not be complete. Uh, I don't think this one is too valuable in the real world. I mean, you, you could definitely um, think about it, uh, I guess. But uh, it's really, you know, this is more of like the optical illusion thing. I think closure's at the top. Um, so this is a perfect example. If you look at the image on the left and the image on the right, there is, you know, there is black ink being used here. And our brain uh, basically in, uh, in implies that there is a triangle on the left and that there is a full panda on the right, whereas if you were to look at the parts by themselves as just the, the black ink, they're really just three Pac-Man circles and a bunch of random dots and lines on the right, um, but our brain composes this together in order to see the triangle and to see the full panda. So let's see what this definition says. When seeing a complex arrangement of elements, we tend to look for a single recognizable pattern. That's, like, these definitions are perfect and simple. Um, which is what I like, because I'm using Gestalt, so. For a single A, that's probably good enough for closure. Um, again, we we like to arrange elements into something that we recognize. And if something is incomplete, it's almost like our brain says, well, you know, uh, I don't like it when things aren't complete, so I'm just going to complete this for you. It's almost like it, it fills in the lines for you because it's, it's not happy with what you're seeing. <laughs> it's like, there should be a triangle there. There isn't one, but we're just going to pretend there is one. That's kind of like... If I was your brain, you know, telling you <laughs> to, to use the theory of closure. Um, we're going to try to go fairly quickly through the rest so this isn't too long. Uh, symmetry is next. Um, our mind, basically, it's, it's saying that symmetry is a product of our brain. That it likes when things are ordered, when things are symmetrical. Uh, our brain loves symmetry. So that's basically what it is. It's very, it's very simple. Um, so people tend to perceive objects as symmetrical shapes that form around their center. Um, 
I think a great example of symmetry is, uh, is the human face. Um, the human face is very symmetrical, and uh, there is a, a study, or there have been studies out there, that the less symmetrical your face is, or is perceived by others, the less attractive you may be. So, let's say you have a big nose, and maybe it, it's crooked. Um, that may be a, uh, an attribute that may not seem attractive because it's not symmetrical, and people who tend to have very symmetrical faces tend to be considered more attractive, uh, but that's just a study. Um, so, we like symmetry. That's what that is. Common fate has to do with movement. Um, we can go look here. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I don't know if it's on here. I thought I saw it. Uh, here we go. So, this one has to do with movement. Uh, so, elements that move in the same direction are perceived as more related than elements that are stationary or that move in different directions. So, let's take the bold off. So, I think this picture is a really good representation. If we were to look at these dots, and if, if the dots were to move in the direction that the arrow is pointing, you would basically group them together in the direction that they're going. So common fate basically means common movement, or a common result. Um, so, uh, again, you, you could kind of talk about um, if two people are walking together in the same direction, you may assume that they are going to the same place. Maybe they're going to the same store or the same building, whatever. Um, that's kind of another real life example. Uh, people, things that move together are grouped together. So, <clears throat> there's three more. Uh, the next one is continuity. Oh, this is basically um, saying that we perceive um, objects uh, that are in the uh, an uninterrupted entity um, as being overlapped. So elements arranged on a line or curve are perceived as more related than elements not on the line or curve. So it's it's basic. This one's a little weird, I think. Um, but if you see something that's going in the same kind of pattern as the rest of the dots, um, then we perceive them as being more related. Um, so uh, for me, I, I, I'm a little confused by this picture. But to me, if you look at the straight line, you would kind of uh, compartmentalize that as being one part and the little curvy line you would compartmentalize in your brain as being a different part because they are the you know uh, the continuation is in a certain uh, pattern um, um, so this the the bottom paragraph says another interpretation of this principle is that will continue our perception of shapes beyond their ending point uh, in the image above, we see a line and a curve crossing instead of four distinct line and curve segments that meet at a single point. Um, so you don't see the top, the top curvy line, the bottom curvy line, the line on the left, the line on the right. You basically see two. You see the curvy line as being one uh, pattern and the straight line as being one pattern. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of a weird one, um, but uh, we'll use the definition that it gives. So, elements arranged on a curve are perceived elements.
Alright, um, so we have two more. Good Gestalt. Uh, I think this might be good form in this article. Common fate. Parallelism. Past experiences right here. I think there's good form. Let me see if I can find it. This one's cool, I actually haven't talked about it, but this is probably one of the most famous Gestalt pictures on the left. Um, uh, the fact that we recognize figure um, in two different ways. So, uh, be, you know, really technically, there is only a black chalice there. Um, and in the negative space, we would see two white faces facing each other. Um, and so it's, it's basically where we're, we're noticing the figure of the faces, um, even though it's technically not there. So we notice figure uh, in ways that may not be completely accurate. So I don't see... Oh, this I think this is basically the good gestalt, good figure. Um, so uh, on the left we would see if we, let's say we were to take away uh, our Gestalt perception, we would technically just be seeing a mess. Um, we would be seeing some weird angles, a half circle, you know, whatever. But because we recognize that it looks like there's a rectangle, there may be a circle, looks like there's a triangle, we would associate what we see as being a rectangle, a triangle, and a circle. Even though the black, the, the reality of it is just a mess. <laughs> you know, it's, it's chaotic, it's disordered but we org organize it into a way that makes sense to us. Um, so, I'm pretty sure that's what this one means. Um, yeah, so if they seem to form a regular, simple, orderly shape, um, it, it, um, that's how we organize it. So, this one is basically going back to prognons. Um, I keep doing that. We take the bold off. Finally, the last one, past experience, which is way at the bottom, I believe. So this one's pretty simple. This is recognized as being probably the least important theory or law of Gestalt, but elements tend to be perceived according to an observer's past experience. Now you would think that would be pretty important, but uh, I think what this theory is suggesting is that our visual perception is um, n not so much based on uh, us uh, personally, but um, shape and form and um, again texture, the organization, rather than taking it into like a more subjective. It's a, it's a little bit more objective. Uh, we objectively see things in proximity as being objects that are in a group or if you know we see things that look similar we objectively group them together it's not like we you know in a split second when we see an image or something we we don't connect it to our own beliefs or our past experiences so this one's a little strange <clears throat> but um, uh, so we'll write down what it says So, because this is unique to the individual, it is difficult to make assumptions about how we perceive it. Um, so, it, um, this is an example of, um, if you look at the, this image, you would 
see a traffic light, or let's say you just saw the circles, let's say you took the square away, you just saw red, yellow, green, your brain may recognize that as being the same colors that are on a traffic light and basically assume that this is a image relating to a traffic light. Um, and so there are a lot of different things and because this depends on the person, you may see it differently than someone else. Um, you know, maybe let's say you just had a hot dog, right? And you were at a hot dog stand and they had ketchup, mustard, and relish. You may look at those three colors and say, oh, that's ketchup, mustard, relish. You know, so it depends on a lot. There are a lot of variables that could change the way you see an image. Um, and that's why this one is kind of a little tricky. Um, but with that, we have actually completed our lesson. Um, some of it I may have fumbled through a little bit. Hopefully it was informational. Hopefully it was relaxing for everyone listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any suggestions or recommendations for what you would like to see next, please let me know. Preferably something that maybe you would like to learn more about um, in the future. This is, this is just one idea. We could talk about philosophy, history, lots of different um, options for this podcast so uh, thank you all very much for watching um, glad to hope you enjoyed it and uh, I will see you soon <laughs>